I'll show you, in, in essence, the way that this would work uh, in an operation, or as we have seen uh, many teams use it, is that the point man, who normally would be the person entering a doorway or crossing obstruction or exposing himself to danger, um, uh, potentially putting civilians at risk, also um, can line up. Uh, they Each team has their own tactics, techniques, and procedures for communicating the deployment of the robot. Um, but the person behind can simply unzip the robot packet, um, turns on the switch. Now, what you would do up front would be to pull the pin on the robot, ask me if I have signal. Do you have signal? I have signal. Deploy the robot, and then you would say deploying the robot. Deploying the robot. And now, instead of you having to kick down the door, uh, we can see who's inside of the space. In this case, if there's a civilian, uh, we now know uh, that there would be uh, innocent lives at risk that we wouldn't want to jeopardize. So this technology saves lives every day all over the world, and, and this, in essence, is a very rough way of looking at how it works. Tell me a little bit about uh, about the Throwbot and 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 about your company. Sure. Well, the uh, the Throwbot is a 1.2 pound throwable reconnaissance robot. Uh, this particular model, the Throwbot XT, uh, has a titanium case, is water resistant, um, <clears throat> has a bubble with infrared emitters that will allow it to see in the dark. Uh, it's used by uh, tactical security teams, law enforcement, uh, and war fighters uh, the world over. Uh, nearly 5,000 systems are deployed uh, with uh, approaching 700 uh, law enforcement security agencies. And what's the, so, so it, th this is not a hypothetical, theoretical piece of equipment. It's a piece of equipment that our forces and other forces are using. Who uses it and for what? Uh, it's employed by law enforcement. Uh, standard police use uh, would be situations like a barricaded suspect. Um, any situation where officers need to see what's happening uh, around a corner, behind a wall. Um, the, the current version of the Throwbot XT also allows for audio surveillance and reconnaissance, um, allowing them to get a picture of developing situations that normally would be outside of their sight and hearing. Uh, it's also used by military forces uh, in any number of missions, uh, particularly we're seeing growth in counterterrorism missions. Should we take it for a spin around Brookings? Sure. All right. Turn it on. Okay. Go. Pull the pin, and there we go. We're up. If you want to open the door, I'll throw it out the door. And then you just drive forward to right the robot. Okay. So how fast does it go? 22 decibels, which is about the volume of a library whisper. And tested to 1.5 feet per second. What's the range? Uh, 300 feet line of sight. So that would be unobstructed. Uh, and we estimate 100 to 150 feet indoors. Um, subject to the strength of the interference, whether it's the, the depth of the wall, thickness of materials, that kind well, of thing. Well, we're going to go visit Daryl West here, who's sitting at his desk. Um, let's see. That Daryl West is the, is the vice president of Brookings for Governance Studies. Let's see. You don't have any heat fired missiles. Just for the record, Andrew, no one's ever tried to arm one of these things, right? Uh, no, we are a, a life saving company. We are in the reconnaissance, surveillance, and uh, life saving technology space. How much do they cost? And um, you know, how many of them have been, been sold? Tell me a little bit about the company and you know, sort of how, how you guys came to, to make this, you know, tiny little thing that that that, that soldiers and cops can, can throw and, and, you know, get recognizance from? Sure. Uh, well, the, the original Throwbot was born uh, of a Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or DARPA, program at the University of Minnesota, uh, Laboratory for Robotics. Um, in 2006, a number of the students working on that project formed uh, a company to start producing the robots, and in 2007, uh, the first uh, commercial Throwbot uh, was introduced to the market. Um, and since that time, this system here that you're seeing, the Throwbot XT, um, sells for about $14,000. Um, and as I said, we are now approaching 5,000 systems deployed or under contract around the world uh, with U.S. 
uh, and um, international law enforcement and military forces. So what would be a, a, um, a plausible non-security use of the throwbot? Um, I, I, for, I foresee the throwbot and small systems like it um, moving into all kinds of spaces where people need to get eyes, ears, um, or senses into spaces that are either uncomfortable, dirty, uh, or dangerous for humans. The entire purpose of a throwable robot uh, is that it is um, usable by dismounted troops. Uh, the traditional reconnaissance robot platforms that we've seen evolve in the last decade are very heavy. Uh, they offload from vehicles. Uh, they weigh upwards of 100 to 150 pounds. Um, this particular robot was de designed under DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, um, in uh, the early 2000s, meant to allow uh, dismounted foot mobile troops um, the ability to see across uh, behind walls uh, and into situations, again, like I said, where it will uh, protect their lives and the lives of civilians. And what, um, you know, w when you say it's throwable, what, what, what does that mean? I mean, you, you know, it, it, it is a piece of high-tech electronic equipment. Um, what can it survive and what can't it survive in, in, in a tactical situation? In terms of why this is a, a tactical piece of equipment as opposed to a toy or, you know, a, a, a throwable remote control device, uh, is that it, with a titanium shell, uh, aircraft aluminum chassis, and integrated robotic sensors and systems, uh, it survives throws of upwards of 30 feet onto concrete. Um, it survives throws of upwards of 120 to 150 feet um, across the ground uh, and operates up to 300 feet from the user by line of sight up to, uh, up to 100 to 150 feet indoors. Um, so really, it is, it's a force multiplier for any dismounted security or military personnel. Now we're in, in Bill Galston's office here now, which, as you can see, is, is, uh, is, a, is, is, a, is an area with uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hostile environment, actually. Um, uh, <laughs> so um, it's, it's a good thing the robot can uh, yeah can scout can, it can, out can for scout us. out and handle at right. least a two-inch threshold on some of those piles. Good. When, when we think of night special forces raids in Afghanistan, are they coming up on compounds, taking one of those things, throwing them in, checking out what's going on before they go in? Uh, is, is, is that actually a sort of realistic common use of it? Uh, absolutely. And uh, not just in places like Afghanistan or Iraq or uh, places where there are deployments in, in Africa. I think um, increasingly we are seeing this deployed in uh, conventional law enforcement. Um, applications, as I mentioned, where, where you would have uh, any type of situation where there's a barricaded suspect, uh, frequently in domestic situations. Um, police can save lives uh, by seeing in advance what the situation is before entry. Um, we know that it was used in a number of European counterterrorism raids. Um, we also know that domestically in the United States, um, it's used by um, upwards of hundreds of uh, tactical teams in situations where, uh, again, the suspect is barricaded uh, or a situation where they might normally have to break down a door or deploy CS gas, uh, this robot um, saves a lot of damage and risk to human life. There's Bill Galston. <laughs> it's pretty astonishing. I mean, it's amazingly easy to navigate it, you know, even without visual contact. Well, that's, th th this, <clears throat> what you're experiencing is um, a lot of, uh, intense engineering work uh, over the past decade by the team that builds this system. Um, most of the robotic systems that are deployed, uh, certainly for security and military use, are extremely complicated and the operator needs to go to school for sometimes upwards of months uh, to learn to operate the system efficiently and effectively. Um, this system is different. It works uh, intuitively. Um, you obviously picked up the, the, OS, the operator control unit and have been very successfully um, driving a reconnaissance and surveillance mission on your office floor uh, with little or no training. Let's go visit Christine Jacobs. Christine is our um, is, is the is the uh, director of public relations for for yeah, okay. governance studies here at Brookings. Oh my God. Um, it's too bad the interns are all at Friday lunch, or we would go terrorize them. <laughs> just attacked Alan Friedman, our cybersecurity expert. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> see if we can. Uh, I'm stuck. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, he, he, oh he's picked it up. You've, you've, been, ab <laughs> you've, you've been abducted. <laughs> um, 
So you, you learned something very important, and th this is an important point. Is uh, that was an early question uh, many customers had. It was you know. Really, tell them to throw it. You have an embedded drone. Yeah, uh, but but again, we now if if we wanted to know what was happening in his office or if someone was in his office, we learned very important information uh, without having to knock down a door. And, and who are, I mean, you say law enforcement and military clients are the principal, principal clients. Are they, you know, mostly U.S. military or mostly, you know, are there are a lot of fine, foreign clients? Who don't you sell it to? Um, the early adopters of the system uh, were law enforcement in the U.S. Um, a lot of tactical teams uh, adopted it, similarly to the expansion of things like uh, sappy plates for uh, protection in bulletproof vests. Uh, when they are seen and used by tactical users, uh, they're proven as a proof of concept. Um, the U.S. military then subsequently asked for uh, robots, seeing how it would save troops' lives and how it would save civilian lives uh, in active theaters of combat. Uh, several thousand robots were sold to the U.S. military, um, and increasingly, we're seeing the international footprint expand um, with uh, U.S. friendly forces around the world. So, Andrew, on a, on a personal note, you have a, 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 a personal story that I think is will be fascinating to a lot of viewers of this. Um, you're part, you're a robotics executive, you're also an ex-Marine, you're also a national security lawyer who you know, does a lot of work with the, with the standing committee. How does one go from, from national security law to, to does, you know, to, to being a robotics exec for, for, for uh, Recon Robotics? Uh, well, well, like many things in life, 90% uh, of success is showing up. I think Woody Allen said that. Um, this company happens to be in, headquartered in my hometown of Edina, Minnesota. Um, and I was reading an article um, while I was doing some program management uh, for another Fortune 500 company with the intelligence community um, on how this technology was revolutionizing SWAT tactics uh, in the Wall Street Journal. Um, so I uh, had a phone call with the CEO, Alan Bignall, and met with some of the uh, engineers and senior executives at the company. Um, and uh, I am a believer that this is going to save lives and it's going to revolutionize uh, the way that tactical teams and dismounted infantry operate. Thank you. Well, thank you.